strategies to promote your book in 2020 and beyond with special guest Derek Dupker on today's episode. Today's episode is brought to you by Bluehost. Choosing the right hosting for your online business is critical. Bluehost has reliable servers and beginner-friendly onboarding waiting for you at servermaster.com front slash blue. Are you tired of dealing with your boss? Do you feel underpaid and underappreciated? If you want to make it online, fire your boss and start living your retirement dreams now. Then you've come to the right place. Welcome to Serve No Master Podcast, where you'll learn how to open new revenue streams and make money while you sleep. Presented live from a tropical island in the South Pacific by best-selling author Jonathan Green. Now, here's your host. Guys, we have an amazing guest today, and I'm so excited to spend some time with Derek. He's someone that we've been on each other's radars. I've interviewed him for this podcast a long time ago. In the first 161 episodes, there are only about two or three interviews, and he was one of them because his was the first course that really taught me loads about how to start running Amazon ads. That's how I began my Amazon ads process was going through his course as a customer. And he also teaches amazing content about audiobooks. And today in this amazing interview, he's going to talk about strategies that work and now no longer work. So you know what to invest your time in to promote your books, the steps you need to take if you want to build a business around your book. And he's going to share his experiences and mistakes to show examples of what worked for him and what could work for you too. This is an amazing interview and I think you guys are going to love it. So let's see what he has to say right now. Derek Dupner is a rock guitarist turned seven time number one bestselling author who discovered a proven process that turned him from a struggling author to selling over 75 thousand copies of his books and now he shares this process through with thousands and thousands of authors just like us through workshops courses and even live retreats where he empowers them to turn their passion for writing to thriving business Derek, we're so excited to have you here thank you for being here today yeah i'm glad to be here jonathan thank you so i'm curious always when i talk to authors like you who you know been through the same journey i have where it's you know we all think that first book is going to knock it out of the park with no effort it's going to be magical but before that what inspired you to write that very first book how did you how did it all start yeah i mean i there's a lot of different places i could start on my journey but i'll say that it really was uh i was living in nashville tennessee i got my degree in music and so i never expected to be a writer or an entrepreneur i'm like i'm just going to become a rock star that was my dream it was the only thing i had in mind and i was just thinking recently a part of my story i don't uh share as much is i was working at a hotel as a five-star hotel i was a valet parking and doing the night shift and stuff and while i was working there i was broke uh and then i was also seeing it was five-star hotel so like wealthy people would come in and at first i was like i don't really get this whole like rich lifestyle that's not for me you know i just want to make music and i'm a creative artist but then like i started to see it more and more and i'm like you know it'd be kind of nice if i had a little bit of money like if i wasn't you know, uh just barely scraping by each month and so that got me into this whole thing about uh, studying online marketing because I'm working a night shift. I have free time that I can get on my computer and that immersed me into this world of blogging and internet marketing and creating videos and things like that. And it would be a couple of years later after I moved to LA that I, I actually won a Kindle e-reader. And at this point I'd already been blogging for a little bit and I thought, well, maybe I can take my writing and turn it into a, a book. So I, published my first Kindle book called Excuse Proof Fitness. And this was middle of 2012, launch it and it sells about three copies in that first month or two. And then I'm like, okay, well, I didn't really put in the marketing effort. So I wrote my second book and this time, like from start to finish, I'm studying courses, I'm going through books. I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this, everything A to Z perfect. And this thing is going to take off. Well, I launched my second book, how to stick to a diet. And uh, it makes about, it does a little better, makes about $70 in that first month. Now, keep in mind, I spent months working on this. <laughs> I don't know how many, like probably over a hundred hours. So I'm like, okay, let's see, less than a dollar per hour worth of work. That's not really the best use of my time, but it was cool. The nice thing, you know, if you've ever had, if you ever make one sale online, if you ever, you know, whether that's a book or something else, like that first sale to a stranger, like, you know, who's not, and in, in my case, like my first book, maybe I sold to my mom a copy and, you know, a couple people who knew me, but to sell to a stranger and then get a review from someone that I had never met before who read the book and said how, you know, mentioned this book helped me. It was great. That gave me some early inspiration. And then a few months later, I wrote my third book 
your first book, you sold like three copies. The second book was like $70. But of course, then you look at how many months of work you put and you're like, that's less than a dollar an hour. So how did you move forward from there? Did you keep writing or did you realize I need to focus more on the marketing part? So I, I really just wanted to move past the whole Kindle thing. I kind of was like, oh, that doesn't really work. I'm studying the courses. I did what they said. Uh, yeah, this stuff doesn't, doesn't work or isn't going to work for me. And what got me to actually keep going was I attended a seminar and it was like November of 2012. And at the seminar, I learned about influence. I learned about relationships and I was so inspired by what I learned I go, okay, I'm just going to publish a third book. If it sells well, great. I want it to, obviously. But if it doesn't, this is the kind of book I just, I want my family and friends to have. I want a, almost kind of a legacy type of thing. Like, if I just get something out into the world, this would be the book. And it was called 50 Fitness Tips You Wish You Knew. I, I went from blank page to taking all the stuff that I had written before, repurposed it, got the book published within a few weeks, and by the end of the month, by the end of December 2012, it hit number one bestseller in weight loss, made almost $6,000 in royalties in 11 days. And I remember logging in, showing my parents, and I go, this is it. This is what I've been working on for years. It's finally happened. I finally had my breakthrough. And I also looked at that and I go, you know, it wasn't quite how some of the gurus told me. <laughs> I, I was kind of breaking some of the rules that they told me and doing things my own way. And I go, I need to share this with other authors. And I, I knew I even had set the intention beforehand. I go, if I figure this thing out or when I figure this thing out, this whole online business thing, I am going to share with others what I learned. And then so within a few months, I launched my first training course for authors. And since then, I've had multiple training courses. But more importantly, I've, I've prove the process works by having now seven books that have hit number one bestseller and then help thousands of authors. And, and so I go, okay, is this a fluke or is this repeatable and transferable to others? And so I prove that, yes, I can repeat it for not only myself, but I can teach it to others and then they can take and apply it to sell more of their books. So what some of your first innovations when you started doing things different than what the gurus were teaching? Yeah. So one of the things I remember doing different was there's a big emphasis. This was back in, in 2012, uh, going into 2013. It was like very much about uh, just write like a keyword rich title and the way to sell books, you know, you, you rank for keywords. And so I was really focused on that. Now, is that useful? Absolutely. I mean, if you can get keywords in your title, especially a nonfiction book, that will help. But my, I shifted my focus from writing less for Amazon which is where my focus was with keywords and writing more for human beings and thinking about copywriting and persuasion and influence and what's really going to hook someone in with the title, with the subtitle, with the description. And then, yeah, if I can sprinkle on some keywords, great. But when I put my focus on human beings and connecting with people, I noticed that's where a lot of the sales came from. And plus, you know, Amazon did help a little bit, but it wasn't so much through the keywords. It was through the fact that when people started buying it, Amazon starts promoting your book once they see it doing well. And there's a lot of other ways to get exposure for your book besides besides keywords. So again, it's not to say that that's not important. It's a mindset shift of where do you put your emphasis and I find so many authors, even to this day, are sometimes looking for these hacks or these tricks for the algorithm uh, and that's a piece, but the core piece is remembering at the end of the day, you're writing this for human beings. What's going to compel them to actually want to take out their wallet and pay for your book. Okay. And how would you define your process or your method from idea to writing the book to the marketing process? So in the early stages, the uh, first phase I call discover. So it's really about discovering, first of all, something I call your author archetype. And I'll give the three basic author archetypes for nonfiction authors. So the first one is the role model archetype. So have you lived through this experience? Are you sharing from your own experience? You know, for me as an author, I can say, I know what it's like to be a broke author to a best-selling author. And so I've gone through that journey. I'm sharing from firsthand experience. So if you have firsthand experience, uh, you can be the role model. If we go fitness and someone was out of shape and then they got fit, they can talk about their own, their own journey. That's one type of ar ar archetype. Another one would be like the, uh, you might think of it as the more traditional expert or the, um, 
the practitioner is what I call it. So this would be like, let's go with fitness again, a personal trainer. Maybe the personal trainer was, wasn't out of shape, but they know a lot about their topic and they've helped maybe hundreds or thousands of people get in shape. This could be the psychiatrist who might teach about addiction recovery. Maybe they weren't a heroin addict themselves, but they've helped a lot of people overcome it. So they can clearly talk about that. So that's the, the practitioner archetype. And then there is the researcher archetype. So this is actually, I think of Malcolm Gladwell, uh, does a lot of research. I think, uh, you know, Cialdini who wrote the books on influence and wrote the book influence. You know, he wasn't like a salesperson who wrote a book on influence. He went out and studied salespeople and studied influential people and put together what they taught. Tim Ferriss also is a little bit of the, the researcher archetype. He studies a lot of people and distills and, and takes knowledge from different sources and, and puts it in his book. And plus he's also kind of a role model and that he, he applies things to himself. So again, you could be the role model, you could be the practitioner, you could be the researcher, and also some combination of these three. And when you realize what your core emphasis is, that helps you identify the next step of the discovery, which is understanding who you can serve the most and then how you're even going to position your book to sell. Uh, so I can keep going with that or we could dive in uh, a little deeper into the um, into that if you want. No, this is really good. So once someone chooses which their archetype is, how do they move forward through the through your process, through your method? Yep. So the next part is you, so you're discovering about yourself, then you're discovering about your audience. So this is where doing the, the research, or as I like to look at it as treasure hunting uh, phase comes in where you're looking for what is it that people want? And again, this is a nonfiction bias that I'm coming at, but also a lot of these on a principle based level still apply to fiction as well. And I've worked with fiction authors and I'm still covering the same principles. So the research, it could be looking at other reviews of books in your genre, you know, studying who are the other top authors, what are the other top books, how are they positioned, what's working, what's not working in the marketplace, what do people rave about these other books and the five star reviews, what do people complain about with the one star reviews, and yeah, you want to take some of that with a grain of salt, but sometimes you can find some useful information about what's missing in these reviews. And even in the three star reviews, you sometimes get a, a get a bit more of an even handed like, here's what I like, here's what I didn't like. And you can take all of that and understand, okay, what can I provide in my book that's different? Okay. And that's one of the key questions. Now, if you're in a market that there's not a lot of other competing books, then the book itself will probably be different, right? Uh, like I saw someone, how to raise kids on a raw food diet. Okay. There's not a ton of other books out there on that. So that can be a pretty straightforward book. But if you're in something like business or relationships or fitness, there are uh, countless thousands, maybe millions. I don't know if you consider all the different self-published books and blogs and videos and things out there. There's so many things that people could go to for information. What's going to make yours stand out and be different? And that's going to come from doing that treasure hunting and sometimes even interviewing people who might be your ideal client and asking them, you know, what are their challenges? What are their aspirations and dreams? What have they not been able to um, get that you might be able to provide for them? How can you package your book in a different way? And any one of these questions, we could go for an hour on, you know, uh, deep dive. So this is really more the 50,000 foot overview of understanding this. And once you understand yourself in your market, then it's about going, okay, what kind of book can I create that's going to both fit in to the market, but also stand out a little bit at least to be different and have people go, oh, that's why I need your book as opposed to, or at least in addition to some of these other books that are in the marketplace. Okay. So once you've found your place and you see, oh, this is my unique selling point, or this is what I have to say that's different. This is why someone should buy my book too. How do you then get people to notice you? You write the book, you put it out. How do you get that attention? Because the book can be amazing, but if no one buys it, it doesn't matter. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So even before I, I write the book, I'll oftentimes come up with a title and subtitle and even the description, right? So I'm thinking, you, you think about the end in mind. Stephen Covey talks about this. You know, begin with the end in mind, 
NASA works backwards or military strategy. You work backwards from what's the final thing we need to do. So sell the book. And there's steps beyond that, but let's just say sell the book. Let's work backwards from that. Okay. In order to sell the book, they're not buying it based off the contents. They're buying it based off title, subtitle, cover, description, reviews. So how are you going to make your book compelling in that way? So if we go title, subtitle, and description, a simple formula that I give is ABCD, the ABCD irresistible hook formula. A stands for attention grabbing. So how are you going to get attention with it? B has got to be a believable promise. So if I say how to make a million dollars overnight, right? If that's the book title or promise, people are just going to be skeptical. They're not even going to take it seriously most of the time. C, it's something that they care about. So you really got to understand if I say how to sell more books, you know, to authors, that's an okay promise, but how many books in what time frame? You know, if I go, uh, you know, the, this, the, uh, you know, how to sell more, you know, how to sell a thousand books in the next 30 days. That's more specific. If I say how to sell a thousand books without spending a dime on advertising, that's more specific. If I say how to sell more books, uh, even if you're dead broke and have no following, that's more specific. So you think about what's the specific promise that they care about. And D, it comes back to different. What's going to make it different. So I f you figure all of this out ahead of time and you might finalize your title after you started to write the book and maybe ideas will come from the book's manuscript. But I at least recommend having a working title and a working description. And the process, this is my copywriter marketer brain goes, I want to craft a title and a description that is so compelling people would say they buy it even before I started to write the book. So think about how would you pre-sell this book? What's the pitch you would give to someone where they would pay you to go, I'm going to pay you three months, six months in advance for this book and now go write it. <laughs> so you create that hook and then you go write the book. So that's all about the positioning of the book. And then of course, once you have it published, you go, great, you have a compelling book. If people see it, they would want to buy it, assuming they're your ideal audience. Well, now how are you going to get people to see it? And then that's where you go into what I call the Aspire method. And this is the, the top six ways um, you know, A-S-P-I-R-E, that's a, an acronym for six ways to promote your book. And so we can dive deeper into this, but I'll just give the, the brief rundown. A is for, through advertising. Amazon ads are great. There's different book advertising websites that are out there, BookBub, for instance. So A is for ads. S is for social media, which I actually don't do that much of, but certainly it can work uh, for certain authors, you know, Facebook and Instagram and so on and so forth. So ASP is for podcasts and publications. You can, I also summarize this as platforms. You know, what are other people's platforms? Can you speak on someone's stage? Can you be on a, you know, a summit or an interview just like we're doing right now? Can you get to in front of someone else's audience by going on their, their platform? Uh, ASPI is for influencers. So also what we're doing right now is a bit of, of influencer, you know, connecting with other people or influencers, other authors, other bloggers. And that's how I sold a lot of my books early on, right? Because I didn't have a big audience, but other people did. And when they were willing to email about, um, if they're willing to email about your book to their audience of thousands, then it only takes one relationship to get in front of, of thousands. And there are ways uh, to do that, even if you're just starting out. So ASPIR is readers. How can you incentivize your readers to share your book? Right. A lot. I mean, just think about your own experience. I mean, do you ever buy a book because someone else recommended it? And I, I look at my Amazon purchase history and I'm like, probably 80% of books I bought because someone else who had read that book said, oh, this is a great book. You should check it out. So that's kind of the combination of influencers and readers, people who will recommend your book and how can you motivate and inspire people to share your book, uh, especially your readers. And then E is email. So email marketing probably my, my go-to way for, I mean, most of my business, and that's what I say for most authors, the core of your business is your email list. All roads lead back to build your email list. And then from your email list, that's how you sell your books as well as other products and services. So we can dive deeper into any of those, but that's, I like to keep things simple. I don't want to think of uh, 10,001 different marketing strategies. I want to think of six things and go deep on those. And even maybe only pick, you know, uh, one to three of those to, to, really focus on to begin with and then build from there. Um, what are the first steps someone should take when they write a book or decide to build a business around being an author? 
So the first steps I would start um, really connecting with people in your ideal readership. And this can be, uh, for me, I, a lot of times I want to interview people. When I was first writing in health and fitness, I was interviewing family. I was interviewing friends. I was talking to them in order to understand them. There's no intention at this point to sell them anything. It's really about getting to know your audience, your ability to market, your ability to write, your ability to them, to influence them, to compel them, persuade them. All of this is based on how well you know them. So that's the first thing. The other thing I would start right early on building the relationships with influencers with other people in your genre because the idea is not to reach out to them as soon as you got have a book done and be like hey i got this book will you share it with your list right what's in it for them why would they do that especially if they don't even know you right so if you're building the relationship do that early on now say build a relationship you go great well how do i do that what does that even look like and uh you know again we could go two hours on that but i'll give a, a few quick pointers one is think about what you can do for them. One thing that almost every influencer or person in the world appreciates is a sincere compliment. So one way to connect with them is to reach out and tell them what you admire and what you appreciate about them and their work. Uh, another more uh, specific way to benefit them is you can even offer them a testimonial, uh, written or video testimonial. And this again is you're giving value to them without asking for anything in return. You could also within your book, this is more nonfiction, but you can do this with fiction too, like at the end have recommended resources and recommend their book and their content. And so the book of mine that the first book that took off 50 fitness tips you wish you knew throughout the book, I was sprinkling in recommendations of people that I really liked. I'm like, this person has a great blog, blah, 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 blah. So now what happens when I reach out to them, I'm not coming in saying, Hey, I got this book, share it with your audience. I'm letting them know, Hey, you know, I mean, I really love your work. I actually mentioned you in my upcoming book. Right. So notice is positioned as I'm constantly thinking about how I can help them. And it's coming without an expectation. I'm not expecting anything in return. I'm doing it from a place of gratitude. I appreciate them. I appreciate their work. I'm going to talk about them and share them with my audience, regardless of whether or not they ever do anything for me. And when you start cultivating those relationships, when it does come time for you to share your book, they'll be much more receptive, especially when they see the benefit that, hey, if I share this author's book, it's actually going to help me because more people are going to learn about me because they mentioned me in the book. Right. So now that's the what's in it for me from the influencers perspective. OK, so those are a couple specific strategies, but it's not to say you have to do those exact strategies. It's really about this mindset of constantly going, how can I help this person achieve their goals? What do they value? How can I help them further them, uh, their own mission? And through that, like Zig Ziglar says, and, you know, the more you help others get what they want, the more uh, you get what you want. So that's the mindset going in. And that's how you can start cultivating those relationships before you ever even begin writing a single word. So it's thinking about how you can help other people before just think rather than just thinking about how to help yourself, which is awesome. Because so often we don't know how to reach out to people that we do it in the wrong way. We burn that bridge. But what are some of the other possible obstacles a new author, a new writer might face that um, they can start to prepare for now? What should they be paying attention to as they get started in this process? Well, it's funny. When you first brought that up, I mean, my my instincts are to go to strategy and marketing and sales. And I, I feel like that's what a lot of people want to hear about. And at the same time, I also notice what really stops people uh, when they write a book is more the emotional journey of actually getting the book done and being willing to put themselves out there, right? The feeling for me, Early on, who's going to want to listen to me? Who's going to want to buy my book? So many other books out there. What if people think it sucks? I get one star review. Right? It's a lot of this stuff, uh, you know, this internal resistance. And so that's actually one of the bigger challenges, uh, both when it comes to getting a book done and then when it comes to boldly marketing yourself and promoting yourself. Uh, so I'll share two things. One is the uh, overcoming some of the internal resistance. If I give one strategy, like one strategy, one life tip before I die for anything, anything that you're doing, it would be the three magic words technique. And the three magic words technique you can use to overcome fear, procrastination, perfectionism, just about anything that holds a person back. And the way it works 
is start with these three words, can I just, and then you insert a micro commitment. So BJ Fogg, a Stanford researcher talks about this idea of tiny habits. The idea is, can I just, I don't feel like writing. I just want to serve Facebook. Can I just write one sentence? Then I can stop. So you give yourself the smallest possible target that you're going to say yes to. Okay, maybe one sentence is too much. Can I just open up my word processor, <laughs> write one word in it, and you make it so tiny. It's almost hard to say no to that. That's the idea. And once you do that one tiny action, you take it one step further. Okay, can I just do a little more? Can I write a second sentence? And Tim Ferriss talks about this idea. His commitment, which is a little more than a micro commitment, but it's still the same idea was, can I write two crappy pages a day? Right? So you lower the standard and it's counterintuitive, especially if you're a high achiever, lower the bar, right? Lower your standard of quality. And I come from a fitness background. So I look at it like you don't just wake up first thing in the morning and then try to run like a full full bore sprint as fast as you get, you warm up first. You don't just go to the gym and load up the heaviest you've ever bench pressed or squatted and try to lift that first go. You warm up, right? So this is the warm up process. And once you get into momentum, the momentum generates motivation. The motion generates momentum, the momentum generates motivation. So you give yourself small little targets to shoot for. And it's how I, if I want to clean my apartment, I look at my whole apartment, I, go, I don't feel like cleaning my whole apartment now. And then I'd procrastinate. But if I go, can I just clean off my desk here? It'll take me a minute and then I can quit if I want. It's this little mind game where I clean it. I see, oh, that's clean. That's kind of, oh, I, I, well, now that I'm up and doing it, I, I might as well clean off this desk. I might as well do this. Next thing you know, I'm doing it effortlessly, cleaning the whole apartment effortlessly. It's the same thing with writing. You know, writing one sentence leads to two, leads to a paragraph, leads to more. Okay. So that's the technique for getting yourself into action if you're facing internal resistance. Um, and I mean, I, I guess there's other things you go on, but that's, that's the main thing that I'm going to uh, share. And if you get nothing else out of this interview, I would say apply that to your life, whether it's in your writing or author career or anything else. And that is the, the ultimate productivity tool that I could give uh, anyone. Okay, that's really good about starting small and building consistent action. I love that thought because that definitely works for me. One other thing I'm thinking about is some of the people here, they've already written their first book, they published it, and then the results were lackluster or not what they were expecting. So many people, at least who talk to me, go, I'm going to write a book and I'm going to become a millionaire. Then they launch the book and it doesn't happen and they start to get discouraged and they lose that excitement. How can they turn that around? Yeah. So first of all, there's essentially four reasons why something doesn't work. And it's important to understand what these four reasons are. Otherwise, it could be misinterpreted right? A person could launch a book and go, it didn't sell. Therefore, that means, and what they put in that meaning, it could be disempowering or empowering. If it means I just suck, I'm not cut out for this. I'm a terrible author. I'm a horrible person. Why'd I even try? <laughs> like, it's not a, probably the best interpretation of, of that. That's almost always going to be false, right? So one reason why it didn't work could be the strategy itself that you learned just didn't work. Okay. It's not an effective strategy. Uh, and that's how most people I think default to it. Like, oh, I tried email marketing and it didn't work. But then I would ask the question, well, has email marketing ever worked for anyone in the history of the world? Yeah. So it's not about email marketing. Maybe it's about this next thing, which is uh, how it was applied, right? Was it not done well? Was it not appropriate for your situation? Something like that might have been the reason why it didn't work. Okay. Or it could have been that it did work, but you were missing something else. Okay. So you're applying these strategies and you might have four out of five pieces in place, but you're missing that fifth piece. So imagine you have a plant and it's in good soil. You give it sunshine and then it dies. We go, don't plants need sun? Don't they need good soil? I was doing what I was supposed to do. Yeah, but they also need water. Okay, so you can't have two out of the three pieces and expect it to do well. You got to have every piece. So another reason it was missing a, a particular piece that you needed. Okay, uh, and then another reason it could be is it might work, but it's just not uh, appropriate for you or your situation or your goals or what you want to do. So that's why you notice you could have a thousand authors that became successful and they took a thousand different paths 
to get there. They all found their own way. There's commonalities, but for everyone who says X worked for me, maybe it's free promotions or someone who said that that's not my strategy and they do something totally different. Okay. So all of this breaks down and understanding that. And if you're sitting there going, okay, cool, but how do I know what my situation, how do I know why it's not working for me? Like, I get that again, you know, I get something's not working, but this doesn't help me. So the answer, the number one way to find why something isn't working for you, especially when you're first starting out, is you need outside feedback, okay? Uh, there's a quote, a uh, paraphrase, it doesn't matter how hard you're rowing your boat if you're rowing in the wrong direction. Well, if this is the first time you're publishing a book, how are you possibly going to know what's working and what's not working? Right. And this is where, you know, I might be biased because I'm a coach and a, you know, publishing coach, but I'm like, I'm biased because I have coaches, I hire coaches and I know how valuable their feedback is. So I see this with authors. A lot of times they're like, I've been trying all this stuff. It's not working. I take one look at their Amazon page and immediately I go, oh, something with the cover or, oh yeah, it's the description, the, what you did there. Or I go, okay, the book page looks good, but I remember having this back and forth conversation with an author and we really boiled down. She's like, you know, I'm going through these courses. I'm doing all these things I've been told. I look at her page. Her page looked good. Look at her website. Her website looks great. She has a good lead magnet offer. You know, I'm like, I'm sitting there and I'm kind of like, yeah, she's got a lot of the right things in place. And, you know, she's studying the courses and I wonder why it's, it's not doing as well. Through conversation, it's like, well, what are you actively doing to promote the book? right now. It's like, oh, I used to run ads. I used to do this. Okay. But like right now, what are you doing? Well, once a month, I send an email that promotes my books. Like, I don't want to be too annoying to my list and blah, blah. I'm like, okay, so you're promoting your books one time a month to your email list. And you're wondering why it's not selling as many copies as you want. Hmm, that might be it. But it took maybe someone outside asking the right questions, or at least looking at things, sometimes actually saying, don't spend more time on this aspect. It's actually good, right? You're actually good when it comes to, you don't have to keep tweaking your website color scheme. You don't have to keep tweaking your book description. It's fine. Focus on this other area that's really deficient. And you're just not going to know, especially when you're starting out, unless you have an outsider. And even as an experienced marketer, you look at the world's top marketers, they have their coaches, they have their mentors, they have their masterminds, whatever it is that they need to get feedback. So I'm just so boggled when someone who, if the most experienced people and the world's top athletes and CEOs and, and authors and business people have people that offer them feedback, what makes someone who's a beginner who doesn't know all these things think that they can get by without feedback? Of some kind, it it doesn't make sense. So that's the answer. You know, get feedback. It can be uh, in part reader feedback. It can be um, critiques from coaches or mentors or something. You just got to have that uh, that outside feedback in order to see your blind spots and determine through tests, surveys, and feedback what's not working. That was some so much information in such a small amount of time. So thank you so much for being here, and I really do appreciate it. And I can't wait to get the feedback on this presentation. I know everyone learned a lot. I know I did. I hope everyone has been taking notes. So thank you so much for being here. Yeah, I appreciate it, Jonathan. Thank you. Hey, guys, I hope you appreciated and enjoyed what Derek had to say as much as I did. I stayed up in the middle of the night because I wanted to get that amazing content from him. And as you probably know by now, my internet only works between midnight and 7 a.m. So I have to record in the dark of the dark. So I'm excited that he shared so much for him. And you can find out more about Derek at DerekDupker.com. That's D-E-R-E-K-D-O-E-P-K-E-R.com. And of course, there's going to be a link in the show notes. And I can't wait for you guys to see what else Derek has to share with you. And we'll see you again for our next interview as part of the Authorship Series. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Serve No Master. Make sure you subscribe so you never miss another episode. We'll be back next Tuesday with more tips and tactics on how to escape that rat race. Head over to servenomaster.com forward slash podcasts now for your chance to win a free copy of Jonathan's bestseller, Serve No Master. All you have to do is leave a five-star review of this podcast. See you Tuesday. Ready to turn your book into a bestseller? Find out what other authors don't want you to know at servemaster.com/secrets.